Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the power of the government to take property unquestionably tests the boundaries between individual autonomy and state <coughs> sovereignty. And as you have all memorized, I am sure, the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment provides, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The legal profession's interest in the takings clause was piqued, of course, after the Supreme Court's decision in Kelo against the City of, Ma of New London, which you will recall, I am sure, held that an economic development plan could qualify as a public use. Now our interest in the takings clause has been renewed by Stop the Beach Renourishment versus the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, which will soon be argued before the Supreme Court of the United States. This case concerns a Florida statute that fixed an erosion control line as the boundary for some beachfront properties. Prior to the statute's erosion control line state fix, the beachfront properties extended to the mean high water line. Under the new statute, the high water line was used as the bound with the high water line used as the boundaries. The properties enjoyed a bundle of common law little rights that come with <coughs> the beachfront properties. These rights included the right to have the property enlarged by the gradual accretion of land. In what the petitioners allege was a sudden and dramatic judicial change in the state law, unpredictable in terms of relevant precedents, the Supreme Court determined that they did not deprive each project owners of existing rights. The court characterized it as a contingent future interest that only becomes possessory if and when land is actually added to the property. Moreover, the court found that beachfront owners lack a property right to contact the mean line, the high water line. The Supreme Court of the United States will determine if the Florida Supreme Court decision that allegedly redefined the property rights of beachfront landowners constituted a taking prescribed by the Fifth Amendment. And this will, of course, be undoubtedly a watershed decision. <laughs> the concept of judicial taking in this case derives from the regulatory takings doctrine. Since the Supreme Court's 1922 decision in Pennsylvania Coal Company v. Mayhem, the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment has been interpreted to require just compensation for certain regulations that interfere with the property owner's enjoyment of their property. Under the regulatory takings clause, some, I'm sorry, the regulatory takings doctrine, some property regulations require the government to compensate landowners even if the regulation <coughs> did not affect a full physical taking of the property or a transfer of title to the government. So the question present itself, was the takings clause intended to encompass regulations and judicial decisions in addition to physical takings? If so, when should a regulation or a judicial decision constitute a taking? Do takings violate individual property rights and foster inefficient development that travels community growth? Or does state sovereignty permit takings to enhance the community? This afternoon, we're privileged to enjoy the insight of two preeminent scholars. Among the folks watching the scholars today, however, I would like to acknowledge Charles Nerko, my clerk, who helps with this, and my wonderful judicial interns from the summer. Uh, Danielle Damasi sitting in the front row, Martha Leibel, and Joseph Tartakovsky is trying to hide in the back, but he can't hide on <laughs> Now our first presenter, Professor Richard A. Epstein, is the Charles Baker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago, where he's taught since 1972. Presently, Professor S. Epstein is a visiting professor at NYU, where he's accepted a permanent appointment starting next year. 
Professor Epstein serves as the director of the John M. Olin Program in Law and Economics, <coughs> as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, and has published extensively on legal and interdisciplinary subjects. Pre Professor Epstein wrote the influential book entitled Takings, Private Property, and the Power of Eminent Domain. Our own Dean William Michael Trainer joined the Fordham Law School faculty in 1991. He became dean in 2002 and currently holds the Paul Fuller Chair of Law here at Fordham. A leading constitutional historian, Dean Trainer's work focuses on the original understanding of the Constitution. He's authored many publications on intricate constitutional issues, including the original understanding of the takings clause <coughs> and the political process. Now, these two eminent scholars are not meeting for the first time today, but they have engaged each other in many different formats over the years. For example, Dean Trainer responded to an, an essay by Professor Epstein in the Green Book, and Professor Epstein responded to an essay by Dean Trainer in the Georgetown Law Journal. They, de they debated in 2006. And then Dean, <coughs> Dean Trainer wrote a review of Professor Epstein's book in the Michigan Law Review. And in 2008, they were both part of the same program at the University of San Diego, honoring Bernard Segan, who taught there for many years <coughs> in the areas of land use, zoning regulation, and economic <coughs> liberties. And so today continues a discussion between these two eminent scholars. Our format will be Professor Epstein will give a 10-minute presentation, followed by Dean Trainer's 10 minutes. Professor Epstein will then do five minutes of rebuttal, followed by Dean Trainer's rebuttal. And then we will be looking to all of you for your questions. Please help me welcome Professor Epstein. <laughs> Taking control of a microphone is perhaps as difficult as constitutional jurisprudence. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be here. I gather I spoke here, if I remember correctly, last uh, October on issues having to do with the financial bailout, and it's nice to come back again and to speak about a set of problems which are every bit as troublesome. Um, as you know, um, the basic problem that we have in American constitutional law is to figure out whether or not the law of takings is a uniform architecture that applies to cases of occupation um, and the same way that it applies to cases in which somebody is allowed to remain on the property, but the government <coughs> decides that what it will do is to restrict the way in which that party may use the property for these purposes, the relevant class of cases, above and beyond those restrictions that normally adhere in the common law of nuisance, or restrict the ability of individuals to dispose of the property. And so essentially the issue that we're trying to face as a doctrinal matter is whether or not when we start to talk about taking a private property, it only refers to the whole thing that moves from one party to the other, or whether or not when you start to look at the way in which the law is organized, the complicated set of private interests that are created in real property, each of them receives some constitutional protection with the same dignity as the whole. And so if you think about the law in this particular fashion, what happens is when the government decides to pose a height restriction by public fiat, that should be analogized to the situation where a set of neighbors decided to obtain a, a, a restrictive covenant on the same land for the same purpose. The neighbors, of course, would have to do it only voluntarily and typically would be required to pay. The government has the unique right to force the exchange, and the contention that I've always argued for is that any coherent conception of the takings clause would require that given the fact that they have this additional right to force the exchange, they should not be relieved thereby from the obligation to compensate the owner for the loss of the interest that was otherwise going to be held. Uh, the Supreme Court in the Penn Central case in 1978 had a better idea, or at least a different idea, and what it did was to analogize the covenants that government takes, or the removal of air rights, which was an issue in that case, the situations in which the harm result is merely equivalent to that associated with a competitive injury. So it's as though one firm has decided, for example, that what it will do is open up a drugstore next to one that's already there, customers move, and the original owner, of course, has no right to compensation. 
Uh, I think the analogy is completely flawed, and the explanation is that, generally speaking, when you're dealing with competition, what you do is you get a positive sum game. What happens is when the customers move from one store to the other, it turns out that they get lower prices, which offsets any loss by more uh, than the existing company gets, and it, in turn, can decide to lower its prices or improve its products so that you get the sort of richness that you'd expect out of a competitive market. The zoning restrictions, of course, don't allow for these kinds of responses, but rather they set up a completely different kind of dynamic. And what I want to say about the dynamic is that it sets up is that it is devastating with respect to growth, and ironically, it does very little to promote general community well-being. So let's see the way in which the game happens. What happens to begin with is that once you announce that the ability to restrict land use or land development is going to be within the scope of the police power of the state, such that compensation is no longer going to be required, you will discover that there's a huge demand for these kinds of restrictions that neighbors have, many of whom would, in the ordinary course of business, subject, they subject themselves to a short-term loss which would not receive compensation. Just the way, in an ordinary situation, if somebody decides to build a house next door, normally you don't have easements of light and air, normally you can't protest the fact that they're going to share the use of public streets and so forth. These things are real losses to their owners, and they're willing to spend real dollars in order to stop them. And the dollars that they spend to stop them are often fewer than the dollars that they have to spend in order to buy off the opposition. So the demand for these kinds of restrictions becomes very great. And then the issue is what sort of process is going to be used in order to channel them. Well, you can't give a single neighbor a veto over anybody who wants to build. So what happens in a place like New York is you develop an elaborate administrative process in which everybody but anybody is allowed to come in and to express their views. And then what happens is some kind of administrative board, or more commonly multiple administrative boards, get to decide whether or not the project is going to be built. And if so, what are going to be the exterior conditions? What are going to be the kinds of safety ordinances it has to worry about, which is not too good? What about the architecture? What about the densities? What about the affordable housing? What about access to wheelchairs? And so on. The effect of the combined operation of these various restrictions, generally speaking, is that it will slow up the development of any kind of project uh, by as much as three to five years, in many cases more, and that's only for the projects that get through. There are many projects, once the conditions are imposed and accumulated, it turns out that there's not enough left for the development to go forward, so that what happens is the entire project is abandoned, and the warehouses that are sitting there on the property remain in their splendor, because nobody can figure out how to put a townhouse or a set of condominiums in its place. These are really extremely devastating and heavy costs. If you look around in a place like New York City, what happens is you see a real demand for housing in Manhattan and similar places, and an utter inability to expand the housing base, because the process keeps everything in gridlock nearly in perpetuity. So the way in which people try to respond to this is they take existing units and then they subdivide them further so that instead of having an 800 square foot apartment in which you have only two tenants, you now get three tenants, right? As the bedrooms keep getting smaller and the bathrooms keep getting more overcrowded, you all know what I'm talking about. And it's precisely because there is no way that you can expand the supply under these circumstances. What happens, therefore, is you get a group of people who are highly privileged under this system because they get to keep out the neighbors and raise the value of their own homes, and other people who find themselves being pushed off into very marginal accommodations at extremely high rents. The idea that somehow or other when you have this sort of peculiar distributional consequence flowing from a government form of regulation that it improves the situation of the community seems to me to be clearly mistaken. What's happened is some people have won, other people have lost, but on aggregate, the slowness of the process, the delays, the expense, and so forth, reduces the stock of housing, reduces the size of the tax base, makes it more difficult for one to provide public service, and it all stems from exactly the same point. Veto rights that can be exercised by multiple parties who have no particular obligation to compensate anybody else for the actual tangible losses that they receive will systematically and always be overused. Now, what's going to happen if you decide to change the situation and assume, as I've suggested to you before, that the loss of a right to build, which is a loss of a use right, should be treated as a species of private property, as a part of the whole, not as something which the government can simply toy with at its free will and pleasure? Well, at this particular point, the entire dynamic of the political process will change and change for the better. 
The folks who now want to stop this property have two ways. In some cases, they can stop it, I think, for reasons that don't require compensation, and I don't wish to raise those here. And that is, you certainly cannot build a building which is likely to topple over and fall down and smash on the pedestrians below. I dare say there's not a single building that anyone wants to put up in New York State or New York City or anywhere today which is going to seriously pose that kind of risk. And then there are further issues about how you coordinate the new structure with the infrastructure, how much parking you have to have off site, what kind of curb cuts you need in order to gain access to the roads, which again would require some degree of public regulation. But everything else that the government wanted is something for which they would have to pay. And they would have to pay for the delay that it was imposed as people deliberately start to string out the process so that it becomes interminable. And we have had some experience with what goes on. Occasionally, like in Oregon, their states would say, if you want to impose a regulation that goes beyond a certain point, you have to pay for it. Nobody has any demand for these regulations once the payment is required. And let me just explain briefly why that's the case. The basic dynamic of all these situations is that the internal gain to the developer is a lower bound to the amount of social gain that you get from the project. One of the dangers you get by talking too much about community under these circumstances is that you don't take into account the interests of those people who would like to move into the community if only they could find a place to live. And they, of course, would profit from the deals that they make with the developer. So you get a huge amount of gains coming on that side. The gains to the people from keeping them out are almost always smaller than neighborhood adjustments to which they will adjust if they're required to do so. So given the fact that the project is strictly negative sum, that is, it costs more, that the, the, the refusal to do the problem project is negative sum, that is, in fact, you get less by stopping it than you have by going forward, once somebody has permission to go forward, nobody will be able to assemble the funds in order to stop the thing by buying it out. So in case after case where you see the compensation requirement put into place, what you discover is that all the opposition to it tends largely to be a matter of cheap talk. Something that you're prepared to say very passionately if it will stop the project, but something you would never be prepared to back up with dollars the way the developer is. And we cannot in New York City or anywhere else tolerate a situation where endless delays can impose huge costs of capital, huge costs of uncertainty on the people who are going to try to expand the homes and shops that others live in in order to make sure that a few citizens who don't want to have these things upset the serenity of their neighborhoods are allowed to live in great splendor while everybody else has to gather the scraps on the side. And when the Supreme Court adopted the doctrine of regulatory takings in Penn Central and created this huge void where property rights were indefinite, that's the situation that it left us with. And the proposal that I'm putting there does nothing to stop the sensible state functions in controlling nuisances, dealing with safety, controlling infrastructure, dealing with traffic, but it does put an end to all sorts of other exotic restrictions, which in effect can sap all the gain out of real estate projects, which would be the benefit of the community at large if only allowed to go forward. Thank you. It's really it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and I want to I want to begin by thanking the ACS and the Federal Society, which really do a terrific job of promoting very serious debate about the law. And uh, it's a pleasure to be I've actually spoken at both national conventions and uh, spoke last year at a, an event that you put together, and I'm delighted to be back here. Um, I also want to thank Judge Preska, who's uh, just an extraordinary alum who really is a great her career is such a source of pride to us at the law school. And uh, Professor Epstein, we've actually been uh, debating these issues even longer than, than uh, Judge Preska's uh, very generous introduction indicated. Um, well, I wrote my student note in 1985 on the original understanding of the takings clause. I think the first letter I got was a letter from Professor Epstein. I was very excited, you know, a major, uh, major figure in the world of scholarship writing a student about his note. 
and it was basically one paragraph saying that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but, I, but I was honored to get it. So, um, so let, me, let me approach the same question from a couple of different ways. Okay. Um, the first is, when we look at the law, you know, what's the original understanding of the regulatory takings doctrine? Which I think was really, that's the first question that Judge Preska asked. Um, and the original understanding is that there, there is no regulatory takings doctrine. Um, in Professor Epstein's approach to constitutional law, the takings clause is really read to be about efficiency. And it becomes the basic principle of constitutional law. Uh, and he's argued, beginning with his book, Takings, essentially the court should intervene and statutes and municipal regulations and government actions that are inefficient run afoul of the Takings Clause. They're, they're regulations that run afoul of the Takings Clause. But if you go back to the framing, uh, the Takings Clause is, is, first of all, very much literally uh, an afterthought. Uh, if you go through the Bill of Rights, there are an enormous number of clauses there's only one clause in the Bill of Rights that was not proposed by a state ratifying convention, and it's the takings clause. Uh, it's only in the Bill of Rights because when Madison drafted it, um, he, he added it, and it's the only clause that he added. Um, you don't really have, uh, there's no debates in Congress, there are no debates in the state about what it meant. Uh, there seem to be two, there are two justifications that we find immediately. Uh, one is that during the Revolutionary War, there was a lot of impressment of goods by the military. Uh, and this was designed to address that. Uh, to say that if the, um, actually, Judge Preston, could you hand me the uh, mission? Thanks, Thanks very much. So, um, if the government physically seized your property in time of war, it had to, had to pay you for it. So the very first constitutional law treatise that we have from 1803, St. George Tucker's, says the clause was, quote, probably intended to restrain the arbitrary and oppressive mode of obtaining supplies for the army and other public uses by impressment as was too infrequently practiced during the Revolutionary War. So that seems to be the major reason why we have in the Constitution. It's about seizure by the military of goods during wartime. Uh, the other reason why it seems to be in the Constitution is that Madison was very concerned that Congress would in some way try to abolish slavery. Uh, and if it did, he wanted to provide <coughs> compensation for the slave owners. And he's, he has a couple of letters that he wrote afterwards that said that this is what the takings clause would do. And all of the cases uh, before the Civil War are about physical seizures use of the eminent domain power. Uh, the leading treatise on the area uh, said, there's no taking without a touching. Okay? So the takings clause, if you look at the original understanding, to the extent that we have evidence, if you look at the early case law, uh, is not about regulations. It's just about physical seizure. So when the government takes private property, physically takes private property, a house for a road or a school, it's got to pay you for it. That's the original understanding. That's the early case law. No regulations. Regulations are not implicated by the clause. And the text is the same way. So if you're an originalist, you would just reject the whole doctrine of regulatory takings. Uh, if you're a textualist, if you look at the text, and Judge Preska started out with the words of the clause, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The notion of taking private property is very much kind of a physicalist notion, taking private property. Uh, to use an example that I've often used in the past, uh, if I were to say to my daughter, Catherine, uh, Catherine, you can't play with your ball in the house. Um, Unless you were deeply steeped in Professor Epstein's writings, which, as it happens, she's not, though I think she will be eventually, uh, she would not say, you have taken my ball. She still has the ball. I have regulated her use of the ball, but I have not taken it. So for an originalist, 
For a textualist, there are no regulatory takings. For somebody who looks at the original case law, there are no regulatory takings. Now, as Professor Epstein says, uh, at this point, there are about, for about 80 years, actually a little more, uh, the Supreme Court has recognized a doctrine of regulatory takings. Uh, and the lead case to establish that is a case uh, which Judge Prescott told us about, Pennsylvania Coal versus Mann, which is a 1922 case. So we have a doctrine of regulatory takings. Now, again, if you're a serious originalist or you're a serious textualist, you should just repudiate the whole doctrine. But if you're going to have the doctrine of regulatory takings, you should read it narrowly. Why is that? Uh, because it's essentially unmoored if you don't read it narrowly. Uh, there's no text. There's no original understanding. The case law is deeply muddled. And so unless you take a narrow, constrained view of the takings clause, uh, you're, it's really it's an invitation to judicial activism. Uh, it's an invitation to second-guessing a broad range of government decisions. Again, that's really what Professor Epstein is arguing for. And that is not good constitutional law if you don't have a text or an original understanding or something to limit the courts. Because, you know, we, we're in a, in a we're, it's we the people. Courts shouldn't be intervening unless they have some limiting principle. And in Professor Epstein's approach, they don't. Okay. So that's, um, that's basically what I would say as a constitutional law scholar. Now, you know, Professor Epstein's point, which I think has a lot of force about the actual implications of, you know, what takings, what, you know, what modern takings actions need in practice, um, you know, there is a lot of interference with economic growth. You know, if you think about, you know, if you go back to the preamble of the Constitution, you know, what does the preamble of the Constitution say? Um, it says, and actually if I had my uh, either constitution here, I'd be able to find it immediately. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. There are a whole range of ends that the government serves to promote. Uh, only one has to do really with, with, or only part of it is about promoting economic welfare of the populace as a whole. You know, I think Professor Epstein is right that takings law now sacrifices growth for other ends, but other ends like equality, like justice, uh, are valuable, and the court should not intervene to second guess majorities. Which isn't to say that every takings law is correct. You know, that every uh, action of every government instrumentality is right? They're not. You know, uh, clearly there are times in which courts are, in which uh, legislatures and, and cities <coughs> slow down growth too much. Uh, I mean, I think there's no question about that. But the question is really, should courts intervene to stop that? And they don't have a metric to do it that doesn't provide an open sesame for them the second, second guess, the legitimate decisions of majorities. And just two examples, think about, if you look around the city, um, the case that Professor Epstein is talking about, uh, Grand Central, Penn Station, which involved Grand Central Station. Now, Grand Central Station would have been, the city landmark Grand Central Station to preserve a landmark. Uh, Grand, you know, Grand Central Station would look dramatically different if the city had not been able to landmark it. It would have had an encased modern sculpture, modern building, uh, with a skyscraper on top. Uh, yes, the city did sacrifice you know, economic growth, but it served another end. It served the well-being of the city. Uh, and the final point is, uh, you know, I think Professor Epstein's uh, uh, approach would have invalidated the use of eminent domain that allowed Fordham to acquire this property. <laughs> Not trying to turn the crowd against you, Richard. <laughs> but this was a classic use of eminent domain uh, for a private property owner. I think under Professor Epstein's approach, it would have been invalidated. It clearly did not involve a nuisance activity, but it was the key to the revitalization of the Upper West Side, as well as to the education of everyone in this room.
So, you know, what this shows is that there are compelling reasons why courts should defer to majoritarian decision makers. Majorities don't always get it right, but given the basic principles of constitutional law and given our commitment to decision making by we the people, the court should defer. as narrowly as a bill would want to construe the takings clause. Um, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, all of them have had, to some extent, differential interpretations. The question is, does that require you to abandon some form of textualism or originalism? I don't think it requires that. I think what you have to do is to sort of understand the originalism. And it may sound quaint to you, but the text that I always refer to trying to understand how you can screw a constitutional provision, which I define as one which is written in stone that is not easily amendable, is the lexicalia from 287 BC, because they have a more flexible view of interpretation of a document than the Professor Trainer is willing to give us. And the key feature about that is you start with a single prohibition, for example, something which says you can't kill somebody. And then somebody presents a case in which you don't kill him, but you put poison in front of him and he drinks it. And you say, hey, I didn't do that. You did it to yourself. And what they do is they reason by way of analogy, saying that somebody who tries to circumvent a powerful norm will, in fact, be bound if the case is sufficiently similar. And so the Romans developed a doctrine called prize, cows and pri cows and mortis praestari, meaning it furnished a cause of death, which was not literally within the statute, but was treated more or less in the same way. And it seems to me that that principle of interpretation was well understood and well known and highly influential on in the framers. And to sort of treat the originalism or textualism as it goes against the general tradition is mistaken. This is the same view which also allows for the interpretation of the police power into the takings clause, which again has no textual warrant and was at no time seriously discussed in any of the founding periods because the technique that allows you to have an anti-circumvention norm is also something that allows you to justify government's takings as, for example, to disarm somebody who's about to kill you, you can't say you can't take my property without just compensation and so forth. It's also important to understand that the physicalist image here is, I think, wildly overdone and ambiguous in some cases. For example, we give under private property powerful protection to patents, and copyrights, and trademarks, all of which cannot be seized by the government, which of course cannot seize them because they're not physical, but essentially they are treated as seized as somebody else is allowed to use them in addition to the owner. And there's nobody but nobody who thinks that that particular doctrine is not appropriate, notwithstanding the fact that there's no physical interest at stake. Even if you start going back to the Penn Central case, it's not at all clear that that should be treated as a regulatory take. If you go back to the standard common law doctrines on the subject, what happens is it was a confiscation of air rocks, which essentially are separable interests, which are capable of being alienated, being mortgaged, being descendable to heirs, and so forth. And what happened was the property owner said, look, uh, you've taken my air rights. And the court says, no, 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 so long as you have the ground rights, the air rights aren't property rights, even if they're held by some separate owner. So that what you get if you adopt the reapproach that has been taken here is a situation where the line between what is a physical and what is a non-physical taking is going to be tested all across the board. And the Penn Central case is probably incorrectly decided because they completely mischaracterized the state law definitions that exist. And the question is sort of moving forward onto the normative side of the situation. I think if you listened a little bit carefully to what I said, I did not say that efficiency was the sole object at any point of the takings clause. And in fact, I made a fair number of arguments that were associated with fairness because I think there's a deep correlation between the two. 
First of all, on the efficiency side, you have to understand what the economic definitions of efficiency are, because once you understand them, it's inescapable that they're implicated by the takings clause. And the two definitions that are known are first the Pareto definition, which says that if you impose a general kind of regulation, it is going to be Pareto efficient if everybody receives compensation such that he is at least as well off as he was before and one person is better off. So the just compensation formula essentially decides whether or not something is going to be efficient. And that's exactly what the constitutional text said. And in fact, it's even stronger than the call the Hicks test, which doesn't require that you pay the compensation, but simply be able to pay the compensation and leave yourself better off. What's interesting about these two tests is though they differ on the way in which you divide gains from government projects, both of them prohibit loss projects. Now, why is this such an appealing notion? Because there's a genuine view of fairness which is involved here. If you go back to the case of Armstrong against the United States, where somebody had a material man, a material man's lien on a boat, and the government decided to beat the lien by sailing it into international water so that the state no longer applied, what the court said is, you're building this boat for the benefit of the country as a lot. Why is it that you want the cost of this thing to be borne by a material man? It's not fair, with their particular attitude, to make him bear a particular loss which in fairness and justice ought to be borne by the population as a whole. So if you think of the takings clause in that way, it turns out that you don't have simply an efficiency machine. You also have a doctrine which is deeply concerned with the inequitable burdens that take place among citizens with respect to the funding of their operation. And if you start to talk about justice and equity and morality, remember what I said is that this is a situation which allows the ins to dominate the political process. Well, why should we let them do it? Well, the argument is that it's not the appropriate function of courts to intervene on these kinds of issues because the things are, in fact, standardless. But they are not standardless if you take the system systematically. Every single rule that you apply with respect to a physical taking on the way in which you evaluate either public justifications for doing it under the police power or compensation can be used with respect to regulatory takings. And the only difference is a matter of technique. With regulatory takings, if they're specific to one parcel, I think everybody would understand what's going on. And they would say there's no offsets to them. So to take the analogy of the daughter and the ball, Suppose you've got nine parts of land, nine, eight of them are built, and they say to the ninth one, you can't walk on that land, but it's still yours. It's like the kid who can't play with the ball. Everybody would understand that everyone else wants to get an open park at zero cost to this particular owner. And clearly to say that this would not be a taking would to mock the political process. So all of the rules about proportionate impact of general regulations are in fact ways to make sure that you don't have to pay explicit cash compensation when the regulation itself creates a social improvement. So what is my agenda here is I think that courts should not decide whether to condemn land or not to condemn land. That's a political function. I do think, however, they should decide that the compensation that is needed in a particular case is or is not provided. And if that's the way in which you think about it, then the only way you can understand this is to read the originalist doctrine to authorize the methods of construction dealing with circumvention issues and with justification issues that were well known juridically at the time of the framing and read the takings clause like any other doctrine in the Bill of Rights. And if you do that, the correct social consequences will be there. And if Judge Preston wants a little bit of help, I'm quite happy to explain in great detail in any case that comes before it the particular norms which will make this a disciplined inquiry rather than a flea-floating effort to deny majority will in those particular cases where it works. Thank you. Professor Epstein on speed dial. <laughs> um, actually, it was very interesting uh, the, when Professor Epstein starts by uh, saying, How do you interpret the, uh, the takings clause? Um, what he begins with is a canon of construction from the Latin world. And that's very much uh, the way in which he generally approaches the takings clause. And I, actually, I'm going to sound a little bit like Justice Scalia uh, in this. 
you know, when you read uh, his book, Takings, or when you read his most recent book, Supreme Neglect, uh, what you find is he has, a, he has an account of original understanding that is essentially devoid of Americans. Um, you know, the, in, in the book Takings, he talks about Hume and Smith and Locke. Uh, there's one passing reference to Hamilton. Uh, in, in Supreme Neglect, it's all about Locke. Uh, there's one passing reference to Madison. Uh, the way in which an originalist should look at what the original understanding is, what did Americans who were confronting this text understand it to mean? Uh, and that's totally not Professor Epstein's approach. He brings a whole can series of canons of construction without any indication that, that Americans would have applied them in these cases. They didn't. They didn't. And the regulatory, the, there is no regulatory takings case law until well after the Civil War. Uh, so I think the original understanding, as you apply original understanding, what did they mean these words to be, uh, is pretty clear and it doesn't cover regulatory takings. So that's my first point. Um, second, what I, I, I did not mean uh, that Professor Epstein's approach is standardless. It's not standardless. It's created out of whole cloth, but it's not standardless. In other words, um, you know, what he is doing is, uh, you, know, you know, he's equating efficiency and fairness. And his approach essentially would bar, you know, any government action that has redistributive consequences. So it bars, for example, progressive taxation. Um, <laughs> The rich people in the crowd applaud. Because <laughs> you're donors. <laughs> That's why I'm treading a little careful. <laughs> uh, it would bar redistributive taxation. It would bar minimum wage laws. It would bar maximum hours laws. Uh, it would basically bar most of the statutes written after 1925. <laughs> Which would be all the better. <laughs> so, again, uh, the, the basic point that I want to make is that as a matter of constitutional law, court should be deferential. It doesn't mean that everything should get a pass, but it should be rational basis scrutiny, which is really what Penn Central is about, and Kilo is about. Uh, and majorities should be free to pursue ends other than efficiency and fairness, which are, in, in Epstein's approach, the same. So I think it's, it's not my notion of fairness, so that's why I focus in on efficiency. Uh, will majorities get it right every time? They won't. But that's the cost of democracy. about the sort of redistribution stuff and, and so forth. Um, I make no secret about this, and, and I make no secret about it because I think that the kinds of institutions that have been created are exactly the ones that Madison, amongst others, feared. Um, I didn't quote him all, but let me just mention two passages about him, which essentially cut the other way. One of them is in Federalist 44, where he's worried about the majorities essentially releasing themselves from debt, which is the kind of thing this administration is today are always willing to do, Democrat and Republican. And he said that the sanctity of property essentially has to be there in order to make sure that majorities don't run rough shots over minorities. There's absolutely nothing whatsoever in the original Constitution which is democratic in the sense of simple majority will, indirect elections, supermajority requirements, vetoes, and so forth. And they were all introduced because it was perceived about the imbalance between property owners, which are relatively few, and majorities, which are relatively numerous. And it was an effort to stabilize them. Secondly, in terms of Madison's own definition of property, it's quite extraordinary. If you read this very short essay in 1792, which is a deliberate takeoff from slight modifications from Blackstone, another person who I'm quite happy to decide. In which he doesn't define it as simply things. He talks about freedom of conscience, the ability to use your labor. Any beneficial attribution of a human being is defined as property five years after or three, one year after the Bill of Rights was drafted. So you can find things in the American sources that go that way. And the last point that I just mentioned, I think it's astonishing to say 
of that when you're trying to construe the American Constitution, when there's absolutely nothing whatsoever in the American texts that describe its scope limits, use, and so forth, that when you talk about Locke, and you talk about Smith, and you talk about Hume, who were the giants of public discourse at the time that all this thing was adopted, we should disregard it. The key point about originalism, or the objections that most people have made to it, is that idiosyncratic individual people choose one thing or another thing, and so when you pick the text, it's a real pastiche. That's the American left's critique of it. The whole point of using the Roman standards, which were known to the framers and carried over by them, was understood in the contracts clause, for example, is that they are immune to those kinds of partisan situations because there are a set of imminent norms about how you read texts which in fact apply across the board. You can use exactly the same arguments for the Fourth Amendment and so forth. And so the question is, if you don't use them, where do you get the police power, which is the dominant trope in American constitutional law? And last I looked, the words were not there. Um, and I'm willing to read them in because I'm using this method. And I don't know how a textualist reads them in. I've asked this question to Justice Scalia, who is frankly hopeless when it comes to these issues, precisely because he's wedded to a methodology which is simply ignorant of the large interpretive tradition of which the Constitution is. Yeah, so, um, sir, reply. Sir, reply. <laughs> So, Madison is very concerned about government interference with private property. It's one of the things that drives him. But how does he think they should be combated? Uh, it's through the structural uh, protections that Richard identified. Uh, Madison has, for example, a very limited conception of the power of judicial review. The protection for private party, property is not the courts it's in a whole series of supermajoritarian constraints that are the basis of the constitutional system. Uh, the, essay, the essay on property uh, you know, is actually directly on point for me because what he does is you know, he is making a political argument there. And he says any government that uh, would prevent direct seizures of property will also want to bar indirect interferences with property. And then he defines property in that way as including rights of conscience, a broad, broad series of rights. But what he's doing is he's, he's taking the principle of the takings clause and reading it more broadly, but it supports the idea that the takings clause itself has a narrow reach and it just goes to physical seizures. Nope. So, you know, so that you know, so I think Madison is absolutely clear, and the original understanding is absolutely clear. And you know, and the base, you know, the you know, there is. I'm not reading Locke out of the founding generation, but he's just a part of the founding generation. That you know, these are issues that they struggle with. Benjamin Franklin, private property is a creature of society and is subject to the calls of that society whenever its necessities shall require, even to its last farthing. Uh, or at the Constitutional Convention, John Dickinson. He doubted that the policy of interweaving into a Republican constitution of veneration for wealth was sensible, and he had always understood that a veneration for poverty and virtue were the objects of Republican encouragement. Uh -huh. Now, so, you know, there's a range of different views about <coughs> private property at the founding, and to make it all about Locke, without any reference to what they actually said, <coughs> is totally unconvincing. Um, I want to know where the virtue part. Uh, it's going to, uh, just one little comment. The word necessity actually has a very technical meaning. Um, necessity begat property is what Blackstone said, and that's what's being picked up here. And they meant by necessity, necessity, imminent danger to human life, starvation, and so forth. And the thought that a zoning board acts out of necessity is to take the term the other way. What it indicates is that the exceptions to private property under the head of public necessity are extremely But we should probably over that. Ladies and gentlemen, who would like to start by asking our scholars? Yeah, uh, Dean Trainer mentioned that uh, there was no <coughs> regulatory understand, uh, understanding of the uh, takings clause originally for the Civil War in a regulatory sense. I just wanted to know if you can tell us what the regulatory structure is like then, if the, if the founders ever imagined that government would tell them people what they can or can't pay the workers, how many hours they can or can't hire the workers for. I mean, you know, certainly at the state level, uh, you know, in the, in the first half of the 19th century, there's an incredibly heavy level of government regulation. 
not at the federal government, but at the state at the state level. I mean, the, you know, the you know, there's a shift. I mean, uh, again, Richard's books always make the late 19th century seem like you know the, the paradisical moment. Uh, you know, it's a moment when we got it right. The early 19th century governments really intervened very much in just a whole host of you know price regulation. Uh, during the American Revolution, there are sumptuary laws, you know, which regulate what you can wear. I mean, it's really, you know, it's, now did they do everything that we have now? No, but it was a, you know, it was a very heavy regulatory state. And, you know, I've been focusing on the federal constitution, but, you know, the state courts, you know, upheld that. Um, you know, so they had taking clauses as well. They didn't see this as running afoul of the takings clause. That was pre-incorporation, though. Now, A, it was pre-incorporation, uh, but there's also, I think, another point, which is uh, the book that makes this argument most forcefully is Bill Milbank's book, uh, The People's Welfare. And I've had a debate with, ongoing debates with Bill about this as well, and I said, look, it's one thing to say a takings clause which doesn't have a police power appended to it is going to be savaged by every bit of regulation. But when I looked down the list of extensive regulations that he had on such things as when you can explode firecrackers and so forth, what happens is virtually every one of them fit within one of the four heads that they had under the police power of health, safety, general welfare, and morals. And one of the characteristics of 19th century thoughts, which I don't dwell on because essentially um, those are not the issues in the 20th century, is the morals head of the police power was construed quite broadly covered all of those particular kinds of sumptuary laws. Uh, but, you know, I asked Bill, for example, um, could you tell me in the 19th century whether or not an anti-discrimination law as applied to private employers or a National Labor Relations Act was something that they would have thought fell within the scope of the police power? And his answer to that question was no. Yeah. You understand. So we got two of the statutes out already. Right? Uh, and they're small, insignificant statutes, but we, we they're unconstitutional. In so we don't view. see much of them. Oh, you never see them, and you love every one of the cases you get under them, right, Judge? <laughs> Who else? Yes, sir. Uh, I also have a question on the issue of originalism, because it would seem like if you were to read the Take King's Clause in a very narrow sense, that would run against other aspects of originalism and textualism, because the clause is actually, what the clause does is it specifies a restriction on the government. The Madison said the Constitution, you know, the powers of the government are few and defined. And that's the purpose of the Constitution. It's not to give rights to the people, it's to define what the rights of the government are. And, and you know, one of Hamilton's arguments in the Federalist Papers against having the Tenth Amendment or the Bill of Rights is because why do we need it? It's so obvious already because that's what the text of the Constitution does. It merely states what the government can do. If we try to read a provision that is a specific example of a restriction of government, then we're running afoul of the whole idea of, of founders that the powers of the government are few and defined. Isn't that correct? Isn't that good? <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, I think that the argument here is slightly wrong, uh, because when Madison wrote that, he wrote that in the Federalist Papers with respect to the scope under Article 1, Section 8. And it was an argument which is rightly understood, explains why this is the Congress Clause does not use the cases where you see your own to your own towns and we can fill them. Uh, it does not have anything to do whatsoever with the restrictions on government that come from the Bill of Rights, which were not the subject of those comments. Now, but this also raises a very difficult question of constitutional law, which is every one of the basic structural protections that was put in has been subject to a lot of heat. The Commerce Clause is, by nobody's intention, interpreted in an originalist fashion. I, I, I would defy anybody to claim that Wicked and Filford is what they meant. Um, after Gibbons and Ogden, which is the uh, The direct election of senators basically transforms the entire electoral politics and gets rid of a lot of the non-democratic constraints on government. And one of the things that you have to do is to ask the question, if you're playing the sort of updating game, if in fact all the structural issues have fallen by the wayside or have been eroded over time, 
Does that mean we ought to put greater attention on the substance of the provisions? And my view doesn't require any change because they were always strong. But essentially, somebody who takes the alternative and that is start and narrow is going to have to really ask the question of whether or not it ought to go broader when, in fact, the structural arguments are no longer there because of all the other changes. And that's one of the hardest questions in constitutional law is readjustment of one part of consequences of changes and mistakes in the other. And the biggest case on that is, of course, Waterhouse, which would have been a huge restriction on state government powers had it not completely misconstrued the privilege of the Indian clause in the it was misconstrued, don't you agree? I mean, no, completely misconstrued. And if you did that, there would be such a chokehold on those jokers, it would have been a delight to watch them strangle the <laughs> 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 Well, Now, and that's actually, um, that's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, and, and Richard raises an interesting point. Um, you know, one of the problems with, with constitutional law, when you get one clause wrong, is that then it puts pressure on other clauses, right? So, for example, um, privilege, when a privilege is an immunity is wrongly interpreted by the court in the slaughterhouse, um, you know, then one of the questions is, well, you know, what are the tools available to the court uh, to review economic regulation, right? Uh, and slaughter, you can't go down the slaughter, you can't go down privileges and immunities because slaughterhouse shuts the door on that. So what happens is that you go down the takings clause path, or the due process, or the due process. I mean, I think that's also right. But you know, but what happens is you know you're going down paths that are really not designed to bear that burden. And so again, what you have in the takings clause, you know, you have this clause that is written for a very narrow purpose. If the government seizes your property, it's got to pay you for it. And that's what it's about. But there's also a sense that people have that you know you have to you have to check uh, economic regulation that interferes with basic individual rights. Um, and so, but what you really should do is go back to privileges and immunities and figure out what that is about, you know, which has a lot of consequences. And it's a real mistake. And the court has really been pushing this for a long time. But it's a mistake to use the takings clause because it really leads to incoherence. I mean, Richard and I would obviously disagree with this, but you're essentially trying to come up with a limiting principle for regulatory takings when you have nothing because regulatory takings are not part of the text or part of the original understanding. You know, and so you, know, so you can have Richard's approach, which I would say is just very broad, and then the takings clause becomes the foundation of the Constitution. Or you can have you know, some attempt to create a cabining principle. But it's really the whole path that's mistaken, because you don't go back to looking at you know, the way this was originally set up and revived, the, the appropriate restraints that, in fact, made sense. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, but let me just give you one sense of how crazy it is. The Privileges and Immunities Clause only applies to citizens, including those citizens just being made citizens. Um, the due process clause and the take and the equal protection clause apply to all persons. Clearly, they get lower levels of protection. So there's a sense in which the due process clause is the incorrect home, because what it does, in effect, is it creates robust rights for everybody when the privileges and immunities essentially follow the grand historical tradition that citizens always get preference in their own state and in their own courts as against aliens, which is you know part of our case. When Sandra, no, when Sonia Sotomayor started to talk about the great promise of the equal protection clause, it was wonderful. She didn't read it correctly. But she says that this clause guarantees to all citizens equal protection of the laws. It doesn't say that at all. It says, in effect, it guarantees to all persons equal protections of the law. And if you start thinking about, for example, health care as being a kind of inherent right that all persons are entitled to have equal protection and therefore receive, if you take the clause literally now, you've committed yourself on the alien question. And nothing that I've said here is designed to make welfare programs on that broad. So I mean, it really does tend to change the situation. But it doesn't alter the logic of the takings clause, certainly as it applies to the federal government. And in fact, if you read it the way in which I've done, it doesn't contradict or interfere with the application of any other clause. Indeed, one of the things that I would say about my reading of this is that if one goes back to one of the more influential readings of the First Amendment associated with my colleague Jeff Stone, 
but you try to talk about general restrictions and partial restrictions, motivated restrictions on speech and so forth. I said to him, is there anything you're doing with the First Amendment that I haven't done with the Fifth, or vice versa? And in fact, it's essentially the same approach. So uh, we hear the joke about progressive taxation being essentially something beyond thought. Well, you cannot have progressive taxations in newspapers. It's basically, under current law, illegal. For the same reason it ought to be illegal for everybody. Any revenue target that you wish you could get with a fat tax and do it more sensibly, more efficiently, and less confused than with a progressive tax. And if that's the situation where it's Pareto dominant, I don't know what other value it defeats. It appears if you've got a system which leaves in average, given long-term growth effects, everybody better off and nobody worse off, and therefore we could find some quote-unquote principle of justice which requires everybody to be worse off and nobody to be better off, because that's what justice has to do. You've got to invert the Pareto logic, and I've never seen an argument from justice which has been able to do that. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, I do apologize. I know very little about the taking clause, but I wanted to try and offer a European angle. Um, I was wondering when, whether there was a debate back then as to the definition of property. Uh, your debate seems to have focused on the taking aspect of the takings flow. What about property? Was there any debate as to whether, for example, immovable property, property in REM, should be afforded you know, stricter protection? Just to, to use an analogy, whether you know, uh, real property should have you know, strict scrutiny, let's say, and other types of property you know, have less protection. That could, uh, I think, maybe help you know avoid some extreme uh, results in, in which you know in where under one result you know you have a very expansive view of property, so everything could be covered under it, from you know like you said from uh, the welfare state to uh, to labor laws everything. And on the other hand, you have a more um, a more moderate approach where it has to do more with real property. Was there any debate about well, that? Well, I mean, so I, this is what I I would say. I mean, it's a, that's a terrific question. Uh, you know, we have many different definitions of property now, uh, and they have many different definitions of property then. Uh, and so there's an awareness uh, then that there are different kinds of property and they have different kinds of protection. Uh, the, the essay that Richard quoted on property is a case in which Madison uses property in a bunch of different senses in one essay. Uh, you know, and I would say that, you know, the, uh, this gets back to Richard's point in the police power, that in the founding there are basically two different types of protection for property. Okay, and, and the, you know, in the early state case law. Takings is about physical seizure. You know, commercial <coughs> private property be taken. When you physically take property, the government has to pay you. And due process is about regulation. You know, I mean, that's really, I think, that's where you get, you know, the police power from. You know, and so that is, you know, that, you know, again, that kind of changes over time. But it's a different level of scrutiny with a different series of questions for different kinds of property interests. So there again, you know, it's a question of it, you know, does it, does it promote health, safety, welfare, morals? You know, is that what the regulation is about? And that's the test for interference with that form of property. So, and it actually, it's a pretty coherent approach. Um, I don't think it works. Let me explain why. First of all, on the due process clause, if you have independent substantive protection under the takings clause, remember, both of them are the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution for the federal government, due process has its natural English meaning. Um, it's hearings, notice of charges, consistency of laws, and so forth. It's all the rule of law values that are so ably described by Lon Fuller in his book, The Morality of Law, which is the sort of customary account. All right, so I think that's what that's about. I don't think it has anything to do with the police power in terms of grander uses. It's basically requiring the forfeiture of property or the incarceration of individuals or the sacrifice of their lives for the commission of some kind of criminal offense. And I think it's an important set of protection. Uh, the interesting feature is if you take the definitions of property and even limit yourself to the physicalist cases, you certainly run into very serious problems. For example, the National Labor Relations Act is still unconstitutional. Now, why is that? If you go back and you read the statute, what it does is it not only gives the right to collectively bargain, but it turns out that as part of the bargaining prices, the state will require you to take somebody onto your property with what would otherwise be a common law trespass. And they don't fall within any of the traditional health and safety justifications under the police power. 
But if you go back and you read cases like Republic Steel, I mean, unions, when they start to organize, they can march onto your land and they don't owe you a dime in compensation for anything that they do. If you really want to treat this as a public use, which it's not, you'd still have to compensate, which of course you don't have to do as well. What really happens with every single one of these sort of employment relationships <coughs> is once you can't refuse to deal with somebody, you have to allow them onto your land so that the contract stuff and the property stuff are very intimately tied together. And I still remember when I became a reactionary or conservative, or whatever you wish to call it. <laughs> it was a case that was, I occurred when I was in college. And one of our teachers took us down to listen to Judge Brennan for everyone in the Supreme Court. And some guy was arguing a labor case in front of Judge Brennan, Justice Brennan. And he says, Your Honor, how could you do this? It's a common law trespass. And Brennan just looked at him and laughed. And he says, what difference does it make? And of course, he was right under the statute. But I said to myself, it's got to make a difference, even under Bill Trainer's theory. That's what I was thinking to myself at the time. <laughs> and prior to the law review, you know. But essentially, I mean, the question to come back to Bill, are those portions of the National Labor Relations Act, the Employment Discrimination Act, the Fair Hours Act, all the restrictions on contract which require employees to take in people whom they don't want, are they in fact covered by the common law of trespass, which means that they're covered by the takings clause? Yeah, and so it's feverish yeah, argument. Thing, the answer is going to be no. Um, I mean, when I was talking about progressive taxation, uh, really what I wanted to highlight is kind of the at, the at, the absence of a limiting principle um, in Professor Epstein's approach. You know, in other words. It, it really does, at its core, uh, say that any government activity that redistributes wealth, for whatever purpose, uh, is unconstitutional under the takings clause. And the, the the question that I just want to you know leave you with is not, you know, do you agree with him as a matter of politics, um, but rather do you agree with him as a matter of law? <clears throat> you know, should courts have that power to so closely scrutinize? to strike down so many statutes um, when you don't have original understanding, when you don't have clear text, and when you don't have clear precedent. Ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in thanking our wonderful <laughs>